our fifth grader under or look like your fifth grader under or just like to see this trick up close, come on up and join me. Glad that you're here. Come on up. Da, da. Dee, 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 dee. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put that right there, okay? That way you can see it. Ah, look at there. Uh-oh, I can see my bald spot. That's not good. <laughs> When you're my height, you can't see my bald spot. <laughs> okay, everybody, everybody, look, look, everybody, look at the camera. The camera actually is—it's out there somewhere. Everybody, wave to it. Say, say hi. See, there it is, up there near the. All right. It, now, now, what I want you to do, since this is going to be put out on, the, I'd like for you to say, look at the camera, and on the count of three, say, "God loves you." Ready? One, two, three. God loves you. That way, if it's on the web this week, somebody will hear you say that. Now, I want you to see this. That camera's up there so the people can see this. Because what I'm going to tell you about... We'll do, that, we'll do that at the end, okay? What I want to tell you about today is not about a camera, but I want to tell you about God's everlasting love. There's a word in the Old Testament... It's one word that we translate steadfast love. The word is hesed, okay? And God's everlasting love is that, well, let me tell you this. Let me just tell you this story, okay? God created everything that is. God created all of the animals, all the plants, the, the sea, everything else, created human beings, and he said, that's good. And he gave them a place to live. He gave them a garden to live in. And he said, all you have to do is, is you can do anything you want in the garden except one thing, and that is don't eat from the fruit of that tree. Okay? Now, what do you think happened? He did it. They ate from the fruit of that tree, right? That's right. Well, God said there were consequences. You know, they had to leave the garden. But God made clothes for them and gave them things to do. And what he did was he poured out his everlasting steadfast love okay there you go and and he moved him on to the next to the next thing and he thought hmm he said maybe I can make it easier I'll give them ten rules so through Moses he gave them ten commandments you heard of the ten commandments you know don't kill don't don't tell lies don't steal etc cetera, etc cetera. okay and what happened did they did they keep the ten rules did they keep the ten rules? No, they didn't keep the ten rules. And even though they didn't keep the ten rules, God still loved them. So he poured out his steadfast love. What, when you're done, there comes more water. There, when I'm done, there comes more water. It's kind of like God's love. And he sent prophets. And the prophets said, hey, you, what you're supposed to do is is turn and go back to God because God loves you. And God loves you more than anything else. And God wants you to, to, to love him. What'd they do? They didn't. But that's all right. So Jesus, so, so God said, well, how about, how about if I send Jesus and pour out my love one more time? Ah, there we go. That's all of it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's gone. And pour out my love one more time. And, and all you got to do is love Jesus. Love Jesus, and you'll know God's love. And, and did everybody love Jesus? No. No. No, not everybody did love Jesus, but you know what? Even though the people didn't love Jesus, he still continued to pour out his love on them and say, oh, there, there we go. And see, you just pour, continue to pour out love and continue to, and that there's no matter, I could do it for you. God loves you. God wants the best for you. And what will happen is, is that God wants you to, God wants you to know God's love. How much is in there? Well, there, geez, it's. Okay, there we go. It's like God's love. 
It doesn't run out. It's like God's love. Watch out, watch out. Sit down, sit down. It doesn't run out. All right, no, I'm going to set it here. I'm going to set it here. That's the thing you got to remember more than anything else. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, even if you've done something bad, God's love doesn't run out. God loves you. God's love is, in the words of the Old Testament, steadfast, lasts forever, okay? That means that no matter what, No, nah, at some point, we've got to go on to the next part of the worship service. <laughs> I'm glad that you're here, and I hope that if you remember anything from the children's sermon today, I want you to remember what? God's love. God still loves you. God's love doesn't run out. Okay, let's look at the camera. Okay, on the count of three, on the count of three, wave and say, God loves you. One, two, three. God loves you. Thank you for being here. God does love you. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Names are important. My name is Randall Frederick Flanagan. The last name, of course, comes from my father. Frederick is from my grandfather Hensley, my mother's father. His name was George Frederick Hensley. Randall, well, to be perfectly honest, there are a whole lot of 60 and 61-year-olds running around with the name of Randy. It was a popular name at that time. My parents were kind of like that. If they didn't have a reason for a name, they looked for popular names. My oldest sister, my older sister, her name is Marilyn. Guess who she's named after? Marilyn Monroe. It was a popular name at the time. But names are important because there is no one in the family that calls Marilyn Marilyn. Only the people that have known her as an adult call her Marilyn. The rest of us call her Sis, and the nieces and nephews call her Aunt Sis. Names are important. My older brother, Alan, his name is Ernest Allen Flanagan, and he was named after both my father, Ernest Ellsworth Flanagan, and my mother, Aline Hensley Flanagan, A-L-L-E-N-E. He was named Ernest Allen. Janet and I, when, when the baby was on the way, we were picking out names. And we had agreed on a boy's name very quickly. Because when she was going to, when we didn't know whether, what she was going to be, her mom and dad had picked out the name Stephen. And we had determined that we were going to name a son, if we had one, Stephen Randall. We argued about the name that a girl would have. And it seemed like we wrestled and wrestled and wrestled. And then we named her Catherine, close to Janet's mother's middle name, Kathleen. Names are important. Names have power. In Genesis, Adam got to name everything. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be Adam in the Garden of Eden and, and, and an elephant walked by and he goes, goodness gracious, what was that? And God finally says, why don't you name it? Elephant, hippopotamus, dodo bird. I don't know how the, na how the names came to be, but that's what they say is that Adam named all the animals. There was power in giving a name. And when you give something a name, it causes you to see it differently. Let me show you an image. Do you see the old woman? Do you see the young woman? 
Some people don't when they first see that. The old woman is looking down to the bottom left-hand side of the screen. She has a very large nose and a, and a, a, a scarf on her head. The young woman is looking away from you, up to the upper left-hand corner of the screen. She has a choker around her neck. She has a boa in her hair, or some kind of cloth in her hair, and a feather. What happens is, when you name something, you see it. There was a writer who wrote this that I ran across this week. What one may see as an old rusty spoon, another will see as antique silverware. What one may consider random scribbling, another will consider abstract art. And what one observes as a heap of scrap in a city square, another will call a modern sculpture befitting a large metropolis. That's the Clay Center in Charleston. That sculpture is entitled Hallelujah. The first time I saw it, I thought that we had had a piece of space trash fall to the earth. My first word for that was not Hallelujah. It was kind of like, what in the world is that? But that's what that's called. That's Hallelujah. Names have power. In the scripture, names have power as well. In the stories that were read, the scriptures that were read this morning, Mary sees Jesus when Mary hears him speak her name. Saul, who becomes Paul, has Jesus speak his name. And a little bit later on in that same Acts passage, Ananias of Damascus has his name spoken as well. What happens is Jesus speaks their name, and I believe that Jesus speaks our name as well. In one case, Mary was looking for him. She'd gone to the tomb. She wanted to make sure that she took care of the things that she needed to do to care for for Jesus' now deceased body. And she wasn't expecting to find him risen, but when she heard her name spoken, she found him and responded. Saul was doing everything he could to do away with the name. He had the authority from the the people in Jerusalem to go out and to find Christians and to arrest them and bring them back for trial and maybe even execution. Saul was trying to erase the name of Jesus when he had his name called. Ananias, he was, just, he was just being open to God when it happened to him. In all three cases, whether you're looking for God, whether you're running from God, or whether you're just open to God, God speaks your name. Christ speaks your name. And Christ speaks your name because Christ wants to know you personally. Christ wants you to know that his love for you is everlasting. Christ wants you to know that he knows you better than you know yourself, that he knows even the number of hairs that are on your head. He speaks your name. The other thing that happens when somebody has their name spoken is that that Jesus enters into a relationship. God doesn't waste a name on us. God gives us a name that calls us into relationship. He says to Peter, he says to Simon, you will become Peter. The Spirit is given to us so that we begin to live into our name. Now, you and I provide ourselves names. Some of those names are not real good. Some of those names, in fact, are kind of negative. I've told people before, when I went away to college, I was the first person to go to a four-year college in my family. I had told myself that I was stupid, that I was fat, and that no one would ever like me. And I had told myself that I was probably going to flunk out of college and go to the service. That was going to be my path in life. Not a bad path. People have, been, people have, have made great contributions with that path in life. But I was naming myself. 
Fortunately, there were other people who, who, who had other names for me, who had other names that empowered me, who had other names that I lived into, and, and the first and foremost was Christ, calling me to be a pastor, calling me to be a student. Names have power. And one of the names that God has, well, actually, Two of the names that God has for every single one of us is beautiful and beloved. Now, you have your own set of names for yourself. And some of those names are not complimentary. And you may say, one of those names is, I'm a sinner. I've done some terrible things. But Christ's response to that is, yes, indeed. You, may in, you are indeed a sinner. You have fallen short. But you are beautiful and beloved. Those are the names of grace. The names of grace that are offered to you. And no matter what you name yourself, and no matter, no matter how many names you apply to yourself, God's names for you are beautiful and beloved. And God always has the last word. I'm lost, that may be, but you're beautiful and beloved. I'm angry, that may be but you're beautiful and beloved. Still there. God doesn't give up on you. You are beautiful and beloved. What also happens when Jesus calls our name is that Jesus has something for us to do. Mary was told, go tell my brothers that I'm risen and that I'm going to my father and to their father. Go tell my brothers you've seen me. The first thing that Mary did when she entered into a new relationship with Jesus was she had something to do. Paul, Saul, became Paul, he says, I want you to go into the city and I want you to wait there. I want you to wait there until somebody comes and anoints you. As soon as Saul slash Paul was in a relationship, he had something to do. Ananias? <laughs> well, I have a wonderful image in my head of Ananias because Ananias was probably like my friend Homer Stewart. And I, I borrowed this from him and turned, applied it to Ananias. But Ananias was one of those people who would pray every morning. And as he was praying, he would say, God is good. God is good. And then the Lord appeared to him and said, Ananias. And he said, God is good. He says, I want you to do something for me. And Ananias said, God is good. And he says, I want you to go anoint somebody. And he said, God is good. I want you to anoint Saul of Tarsus. And he said, good God. Because <laughs> there was a discussion. Ananias says, have you not noticed he's trying to kill us? He's arresting us. God says to Ananias, he's changed. I have spoken his name. You need to go anoint him. Ananias of Damascus is mentioned once in the scripture. He's given one task, to go to a Paul to anoint him and to tell him that God has plans for him. One task. That's all he has to do. That's all he does. We never hear from him ever again. When God calls our name, God gives us and enters into a relationship with us, God gives us something to do. Every gift sitting here today is needed for the health of Christ's church. I can give you an example. You don't want me to touch that. If I'm responsible for playing the piano in worship, we're going to sing one half of the hymn, uh, Be Still My Soul, because I can play that, dun, 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 and that's it. And we're going to, the prelude is going to be chopsticks every week. You don't want me to do that. There's a whole bunch of other stuff you don't want me to do for the benefit of this church. There are stuff that God has gifted me with 
that is for the benefit of the church. And there's stuff that God has gifted you with for the benefit of Christ's church, for the benefit of the people we serve. And you know what? When, when you enter into a relationship with Christ, God gives you something to do. And the reason I know God gives you something to do is God gives you a gift of the Spirit to accomplish it. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, I am not wise enough. I am not near wise enough to say, oh, I know your gift and I know your, and just be able to stand and say, I know each one of your gifts. That's the role of the Spirit. That's not my role. But it is my role to tell you that when God calls your name and when God enters into a relationship with you, God gives you something to do. And then finally, God expects a response. I had an image that uh, was shared with me uh, through uh, Krista Rexroad Wolf in her ordination material this year. She talked about a book she had read that talked about God's grace and God's call as being the offer of an embrace. If I offered you an embrace, you have a choice. And there's all kinds of stuff that, that I have a friend of mine who's now a part of the church triumphant. He would not hug me if I paid him because he didn't like to hug. It wasn't his thing. It covered boundary, it crossed boundaries that he didn't want crossed. He was a sweetheart of a man. He was a great pastor. He was a devoted friend. He just didn't hug. But Krista said that what God does in God's grace is God offers us an embrace, offers us to enter into a relationship, but God's not going to force you to embrace God. God's going to offer it. And when you step forward and you say yes, then God's arms of grace envelop you and hold you close and let you know that you are beautiful and beloved. God expects a response. God expects, when God offers you God's grace, some kind of response that says yes, yes. Use me as thou wilt. Yes. Has Christ spoken your name? Have you heard the Spirit speak your name? I believe it happens to every single one of us. Hear the voice of the Spirit this day. Amen.